name is Zoltan Ishvan. I was the 2016 U.S. presidential candidate of the Transhumanist Party, which is a political party that's dedicated to using science and technology to further the human being, to radically modify the human being and the human experience. For over two years, I ran a presidential campaign that was broadly recognized as the very first science candidacy um, in the United States history. So it got a lot of attention and we had a giant uh, 40 foot, uh, uh, or I guess about approximately 12 meter bus that looked like a large coffin because we were going around the country trying to promote the idea that transhumanist science can bring about life extension where people don't die. And what better way to tell people than a giant uh, 12 meter coffin um, rolling down America's highways getting attention. My presidential campaign, in the end of the day, was really about trying to make the public more aware that the world is changing because of radical science and radical technology, and the government isn't keeping up with that change. My main goal was to take money away from the military and put that money directly into science and technology so that we can all have better health, we can all have better lives, and especially longer lifespans. Transhumanism is a social movement of a few million people around the world that want to use science and technology to radically modify the human being and also to modify the human experience. Well, I think 30 years from now is some, perhaps some of the last time you'll see some people. Um, I think by then our bodies will already be to some extent merged with machines. Um, in 30 years, it's guaranteed that your arm will be more uh, functional as a robotic arm. It's guaranteed that they'll have um, you know, synthetic body parts that are far better than the ones we have now. We're all going to be replaced by robots at some point. The real question is how far do we merge with them? And people like me would advocate merging entirely with them. There's no reason to remain flesh. Uh, flesh is an unstable system. It's a system that's terminal from beginning, designed to die. I feel like if I can upload my consciousness and become mostly machine, I would do that. If I can become all machine, that's a goal of mine. ジミノイド、HI4 My name is Hiroshi Shiguro. I'm a professor of Osaka University. Um, as you know, the Osaka University is famous for intelligent robotics, and I believe uh, I'm playing a very important role with, uh, in this university. If I have uh, Android, a teleoperated Android on myself, I think uh, it's easy to travel to the foreign countries. Actually, I, uh, I don't need to travel to foreign countries. And, uh, we can just send the, our Android to the foreign countries and Android can give a talk. So that was a very practical purpose you know, for creating a bit, uh, my copy. But another you know, the, uh, uh, scientific purpose is uh, to understand the, uh, myself. In the United States, maybe uh, European countries, uh, so you are focusing on the particular functions like uh, voice recognitions or just uh, you know the mobile platform right but the Japanese you know we our the research approach is to integrate more complicated things and have uh, you know the more human like robots so I think uh, both of them are important we need to work together Futures, we're gonna use more interactive robots in our societies. So Japanese populations, we're gonna have uh, you know half of the population of uh, the current population, and, uh, and but still we wanna keep the quality of life. So how we can do that? Of course, we need to use more robots and Android. The robot is uh, just a mechanical stuff, right? And Android is a very human-like appearance in the movement. Basically, cyborg is a humans, but. Uh, 
the person is using a prosthetic arm and legs, that is a cyborg. So we are integrating the most advanced technologies for the Android. So best uh, voice recognition functions and the speech synthesis and uh, you know, the most uh, human-like uh, appearance and the movement. to have a kind of a total Turing test. Total Turing test is uh, if we can feel the uh, human-like heart or mind you know, through the interaction with the android, right? Then you know, the uh, robot can be accepted by a uh, human. So android is a test of it for investigating how, you know, the, why the people accept the human-like stuff. Our the fundamental goal is to understand what human is. Well, if we can get some important fundamental ideas about the human-robot interactions, the robot and the android are mirror to reflect the humanity. If we see the uh, robot and android in a daily situations, right, so people can have a chance to think about uh, what is uh, consciousness, what is emotion, right? My name is This robot is in a working system. There are many parts. Almost 10 years ago, we introduced this one for some human robot interaction. And it had two eyes, two ears, and also 200 tactile sensors, whole body. At that time, 200 tactile sensors is too many. Nowadays, not so many. But anyhow, so I'm Aminoru Asada, a professor of Osaka University and the Graduate School of Engineering. So I'm a roboticist. But uh, the mainly, is, uh, uh, we have been advocating the cognitive development of robotics, which is aiming at the understanding of the human's cognitive development process by utilizing the you know, synthetic approaches, such as uh, computer simulations and uh, robots. But the main focus is that uh, we like to understand, uh, we like to get new idea or new understanding of the human's cognitive development. So now AI is a very hot, hot topic and many people you know, are all the, working with the, the deep learning or the conversion network and so on. We like to focus on the much more fundamental research issues, the origin of the intelligence, therefore the how network emerges through the interactions. So many people, many brain scientists, focus on some brain activity without the body, but we focus on you know, how the body shapes the brain. That is, you know, where the brain and the body interact each other. In my lab, we have uh, several kinds of robots, but uh, the mainly focus on the, the, some baby robots and how the humans react or interact with baby robots. Therefore, we have the original baby robot uh, we call the affet. The affet is an Italian word to, uh, I suppose maybe I forgot exactly but the meaning is very cute and very uh, small, is a baby android. It's a real, very, very realistic facial expression. Therefore, one of the experiment is that so we put the baby robots, but the point is to help mothers interact with the robots. So usually the, the mothers or the, the caregivers speak to the baby in a very specific way, not uh, same as in a way to the adults. Just we say the infant directed speech, IDS. And uh, we found that RDS, robot directed speech, is also same as, almost the same as IDS. It means that the robot can induce some kind of behavior 
from mothers same similar to the you know, to the infant because you know so far we have uh, cartoon like uh, mechanical like robots but at that time the, the caregiver sometimes they feel difficulty to interact so therefore we like to focus on the more emotional interaction between the caregiver and the infant we replace the infant to the baby robots and the caregiver interact therefore we need more realistic the baby robot that we have designed but still uh, under the construction the face facial expressions and very compliant movement by using the uh, pneumatic actuators and so on. So uh, this consists of the artificial vocal cord and artificial tongue. And uh, these parts consist of the, some, the vocal tract. And this is some design of the very small lips and the two controlled open, close, and something. And there's some artificial vocal cord. Is that and then this is lung for the air and then artificial book called the vibrate and then for the air and then so the tank and lip change the vocal tract and then they make uh, some vowels or some the consonant and so but still under the wing under the construction not perfect yet so the main focus is a human robot interaction how the robots and the human interact with each other especially the, for the future we expect that you know the robot uh, assist our life as you know was japan is a very high aging society therefore uh, the, especially the senior people living alone in the countryside they need some kind of the assistant not only the physical assistant but also some mental one that is some, some sort of the communication. Therefore, uh, we like to focus on how the, you know, the robot can uh, assist uh, to help the people. Care is a very important application for the robotics, yes. You know, elders want to talk with somebody, but uh, they hesitate to do that, right? So robot can be ideal conversational partners. We did a field test many times already. Therefore, in 20 years, there are many uh, different kinds of the robots, not only the human type. For example, uh, some small robots only for communications, or some robot only physical assistance or something. So the different kind of robot is everywhere. This Bobohan is actually a smartphone. And uh, it's a, it has a touch screen here and used as a just smartphone. Then I got a phone call for me. And then I can use Robohon this way. Hello. <laughs> Once it has shaped like human beings, we're willing to talk to them. And uh, through the conversation, robot can gather uh, customers' data. Like uh, he already knows about my face, voice, birthday, where I live, where's my laboratory, and uh, also uh, what's my favorite food and even my favorite actress. He can gather the information and they use this information for um, customized service just for me. So you know the animism, so everything has a soul. Therefore, the, the, for Japanese people, everything has a soul of the camera or the desk or something. Why not the robot? Therefore, the robot could be the family member or the partner. I believe the Ivo is the first one. Uh, there were many owners of Ivo, but now it's, you know, the maintenance part is uh, already done, yeah, gone. Therefore, now it's very difficult to maintain. Yeah. And some owner really, really involved it you know, or the rival is that. So uh, it's like, a, not simply a friend, not simply a pet, but a kind of partner or something. Ivo was great product, one of, the, one of the greatest robot in robotics history. But uh, it's too early. At the moment, we don't have, you know, Wi-Fi and internet. Ivo was not successful, but, you know, they were doing very well comparing with other robots. You know, but uh, they couldn't develop the real market with Aibo. And Ashimo is also, right? And Ashimo is a very 
or high performance robot. And uh, in sense of uh, advertisement, Ashimo is uh, quite successful. え、日本科学未来館は、え、最先端の科学技術について、え、皆さんに感じていただきながら、あと、それをどのように私たちの生活の中に取り入れていくと、私たちの未来がいいものになっていくのか、皆さんと一緒に考える場として、え、ありたい
と思ってるんです。あくまでもあの人形の造形は人形ですし、あの人間のあの形とはやっぱりあの違うものだと考えています。あの将来的に、えー、動く人形が出てくる可能性は。非常に高いと思うんですが関わりが減ることはないと思うんですがその関わり方は変わっていくと思いますね例えば This robot.、Uh, this is my love, <laughs> robot. The robot's name is the Gazeroid. I named it her Gazeroid. And、uh, I made her、uh, in resemblance of the famous pop star in Japan. I want a girlfriend, but、uh, nobody looks at me. So I made her. She always l o o k at me. She can do eye contact. With people and with me. Love doll is just a body, just an object, but、uh, she can do eye contact, she can recognize me. It's different. It's the love. In the future, we can love each other with robots, but eye contact is essential. When I look at her,、uh, she also l o o k at me. This is love. This is、uh, thinking about love, thinking about how to respect the object. The robot needs to understand the people's intention and desire. So, in order to do that, you know, we need to implement the intention and desire to the robot. Then, you know, the robot they can understand humans' intention and desires. If we can develop that kind of robot, the robot is going to be more human friendly and the robot can understand more deeper desires. So, near future, so I think、uh, we can develop something the, uh, uh, conscious. Okay, so, we believe a human has a consciousness. So, you know, if we improve our Android, so if we improve the function of a robot, so someday I think、uh, we can realize you know, a more human like、uh, robot which has the consciousness or mind, I guess. Japan is a kind of a just a big families, right? They're quite isolated from other countries and independent. So we are quite homogeneous. We don't need to distinguish among the people. So that means that we don't need to distinguish the people and the others. Therefore, we just easily accept the robot as a kind of our partners. The robot needs to work with the people. So this, you know, the robot they can help the people very much, I think. When you look at the changing nature of, of The world in 30 years, it could be dramatically different. I'm not really even sure there'll be very many jobs around for anyone that is just human anymore. You're gonna have to be a cyborg and you're gonna have to be connected to the cloud and you're gonna have to use these neural prosthetics to make you smarter by being all over on the internet at all times and these kinds of things. So that's the only way you're gonna remain competitive. Otherwise, there's no reason to have a human being doing a work that a robot or a person can do. Our manufacturing system is changing. You know, we're going to replace the humans with a n d r o i d And the human can find a much better job. And of course, you know, the, well, another reason is、uh, you know, we don't have enough number of people,、uh, and the robot can help us. So, the most important thing about 30 years in the future is what does the job market look like? And it won't exist for humans. <laughs>
どんどんどんどん日本の労働人口が減ってくるというようなことがあってまあ常に自動化を検討していたわけなんですけれどもヒューマノイドロボットとの導入にあたってはやはりあの海外にどんどん生産がシフトしていっていく中で、えー、国内であのそれに匹敵するようなコストで、えー、自動化するためには、えー、それまでの制約条件が多い産業ロボットを使っておってはあのなかなか難しいので、えー、人型ロボットで。人がやっていた作業をできるだけ行うというような形で新しい新製品が立ち上がる時に海外生産ではなくて国内に戻してこようということで効率もアップして人型ロボットを使った人と一緒に働くラインを構築したということに。8年前から働いていてます僕はロボットの組み立て中のエラーをなくすようにロボットのプログラミングをしています人と同じような形をしているロボットなので一緒に働いている仲間のような気がしますすでにロボットが働いている後に入ってきた人もいるので最初は驚いたかもしれませんけどみんな慣れたように働いていますそうですね最近は見慣れてきたのか特に人とロボットの区別というものがなくなっていて溶け込んでいるような気がしますもしかしたら今よりロボットが増えて、えー、もっとロボットで溢れかえっている現場になるかもしれません Many people are realizing that the jobs that did make them happy in the past are never coming back because of automation I mean if you want to compete in the construction field you're not going to use human arms that get tired and can only lift 200 pounds, you're going to use robotic arms or either exoskeleton suits or something like that that can actually do better. I think it's going to be actually cut off limbs and put on raw arms that are look sort of like humans but are actually robotic and tie into your in internal structures. That's, you're going to see a lot of cyborgs, a lot of people that are merged halfway with machines. There's going to be no such thing as taxi drivers, there's going to be no such thing as food servers, there's going to be no such thing as probably even doctors in 30 years. Robots will be able to deliver babies more safely, 24 hours a day, no liabilities in case they make an error. There's just no reason to have human beings doing this kind of thing anymore. But you know, that will create perhaps a much freer society where people can actually enjoy themselves a lot more. But, The workplace, the economy is going to change. Whether capitalism survives is still, is still definitely up for question. My name is George Bichon. I'm a distinguished member of the technical staff here at Sandia National Laboratories. We've known for you know, decades now that DNA is nature's way of storing information. You know, there are recent studies that have shown you know, DNA that's been taken out of uh, amber samples uh, you know, or even out of the glacial ice cores that may be 10,000 year old that still are viable and still can be read. You know, I thought, wow, this is a really fantastic uh, going away from what we think of digital storage and hard drives to storing information in the form of DNA. None of our current electronic storage systems are, you know, perfect. We know that they fail. We've all been there when the, our hard drive <laughs> decides it's not going to work any longer. One of the things we thought about right away was the fact that DNA is so stable um, and it's also very small, that's the other part. So what we've encoded, you know, can be stored in, in a piece of DNA that can't be seen except with an electron microscope. The DNA is just so small that you, you know, in something like this refrigerator here, yeah, you could probably store, you know, maybe the Library of Congress would be able to fit in DNA that would be the same size here. <laughs> In terms of the applications of this work, I mean, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could make DNA that would store your medical records and we could then 
put that inside some small skin cells, for example, or something on your body that would then take that information and keep it with you all the time. So if you were, say, in a car accident, you know, they could pull out the DNA sequence and get your medical history no matter where you were. If we really want to be truly innovative, we need to accept failure, but um, science is being, and funding in particular, is being pigeonholed by the inability to fail. Um, those failures are being highlighted continuously um, as things that we shouldn't be doing, but we really can't get true innovation if we don't have the occasional failure. There are probably more failures than we have successes if we really want to get that disruptive technology. So one of the important things that we have to make sure is that we're not making something that's bad, like a toxin or a virus, is any DNA that's actively being made by a living organism is susceptible to evolution and mutation. Aubrey de Grey and I'm the Chief Science Officer of a biomedical research charity named Sense Research Foundation. I have the great privilege to be kind of the spiritual leader, the spearhead of this anti-aging movement within biology. In Silicon Valley there are a lot of visionaries, a lot of people who are willing and able to aim high and to think big about what the future could hold. Of course, there are people like that all over the world, but I think that Silicon Valley has the highest density of those people. California is the hotbed of transhumanism, and of course, uh, Silicon Valley in the San Francisco Bay Area is really the mecca of, uh, of transhumanism. It's where all the startups are working on, you know, artificial organs or, uh, you know, chip implants or the, the brainwave devices. I mean, it's all happening in, the, in Silicon Valley. So it's, that's really, you know, where transhumanism, its heart is. The number one goal of transhumanism is to make everybody live as long as possible. And most people believe that means conquering death. So you can actually live not just a thousand years, but live perhaps forever. Sense Research Foundation has a mission to bring aging under complete medical control so that people can stay just as functional, both mentally and physically, However long they live, they will be able to do and look and feel just like young adults, even if they are no longer chronologically young. We think we can do comprehensive repair of the damage that the body does to itself as a result of its normal operation. The goal of the project is to try to express uh, the genes encoded by the mitochondrial DNA by moving them to a secured location uh, in the nucleus. Um, and make them, uh, import them functionally into the mitochondria. So for now, we are testing um, this um, allotopic expression strategy in patient cell lines that have naturally, mutations have occurred and these patients suffer from very debilitating diseases. We have been successful in, in uh, doing one of the genes, uh, which is also one of the smallest genes encoded in the mitochondrial DNA called the ATP8 gene. Um, to a lesser extent, we've been successful with uh, the ATP6 gene also, and we would like to extend this to all the other 13 genes, and that's the goal of the project. We, we want to test if this strategy will work in small animals first, and then we would slowly like to extend it to uh, patients, maybe. Uh, the near future is to help patients with mitochondrial DNA mutations. In order to extend lifespan a lot more, we have to do something that is completely different, dramatically different. And that's what this regenerative medicine, this damage repair approach is going to be. When we can do damage repair comprehensively, there will be no limit on how long people can stay healthy. And if there's no limit on how long people can stay healthy, then there's also no limit on how long they can live. Because of course, most people die from being unhealthy, from being sick. The numbers are just terrifying. Every day, about 150, 160,000 people die. And more than two thirds, nearly three quarters of those people die of aging. 100,000 people a day. You know, that's 30 World Trade Centers every day. 
It's just breathtaking. So to me, every time I wake up in the morning, the thing that gets me out of bed is not thinking I can increase my own chances of never getting Alzheimer's disease or I can increase my fiance's chances or anything like that. I think about the world. I think about the humanitarian imperative. I think about the fact that if I come into work and I can bring forward the defeat of aging by one day, I'm going to save 100,000 lives. ペニクラゲ、ちちちゃにちちちゃにクラゲです。だけど僕には人になり、特別な秘密があるんだ。僕は僕は若返ることができるんだ。もうダメだと思ったら。ポリプニモンドオテイチニサンマシンの名前はベニクラゲもうすぐポリプニモンドレルゾクイを残さずに生きてくれあそれベニベニありがとうございました<笑> あ、皆さんこんにちは。私は久保田真と言います。え、私はえっとクラゲの生物学という風にタイトルをしておりますが、主にですね、えっとクラゲの一生卵からえ、若いポリプを経てクラゲになって大人のクラゲになってまた子供
素晴らしく叶えてくる特殊な動物なので、えっと、どんな知恵を持っている人がいるかもう計り知れないのでみんなでですね英知を集めれば、まあ、1世紀もあれば不審になれると私は希望します。だんだんあの徐々に若返ると思うんですけどもあ,のあるところまで行ったらですねストップできるようなあのこうコードがあると思うんですよね。で私はまあ二十歳まで行ったからここでもういいやとか私はちょっと赤ちゃんまで戻りたいとかそういうあの覚えようっていうか自由が利くようなことになれば素晴らしいなと思われ,思われますね。と私の,あの究極の究夢はですね。えー、とやっぱり老化しないでいつまでも若い若しい体で、えー、脳も活性化してですね、えー、永遠にこの生物学が研究できたら素晴らしいという目標を持っておりますどうしても後戻りはできないのでどんどんあのいい方向に進めていってもらって、まあ、何度も言ったようにその進めら際の基礎にあたっては自分が命を持った動物であるまたは植物にお世話になっている消費者であるそれからまあもう死んでしまったらバクテリアに分解されて、まあ、土に戻るあ、まあ、そういうような存在だということを生物学的にみんな理解してもらったら社会は良くなると思うんですけどね。One of the biggest things, one of the most important concerns that people have about problems that we might create as a side effect of solving the problem of aging is people are worried that there will be too many people. If everybody lives forever, won't that overpopulate the planet? And the answer is yes, it will. And the planet is already overpopulated, I think, and we are causing environmental destruction. But that doesn't mean that we can't fix it. In the next 10 or 20 years, various technologies are going to come out called nanotechnology and other types of technology like this, where we can recreate the planet in a much more pristine and beautiful way. We don't have to plant trees to get forest all over when we have genetic editing. And I think regarding overpopulation, if we can recreate the planet in a bountiful way, we can definitely handle overpopulation. I mean, the planet can handle 15 billion people. It can handle much more than it has now. It just has to be distributed better. You know, the bigger question is, okay, we have a, a feeding problem. You know, how do we feed 15 billion people? Well, what if they don't eat because they're transhumanist entities and they now get their power from the sun because they've used genetic editing in their skin that makes them solar powered? And this is something that people are already working on. We already have、uh, biohackers out there that are working on trying to get energy directly by plant DNA, by putting plant DNA into their skin. So maybe our version of what we think the human being will change so dramatically that it will also solve some of our environmental issues at the same time. If people have to make the choice, if people have the choice between, on the one hand, having fewer kids, and on the other hand, getting sick and dying, or having their loved ones getting sick and dying, they're probably going to choose having fewer kids. So, what we're trying to do is create that choice. And if you're going to live a thousand years, will you have kids in the first hundred or two hundred or three hundred years? Of course, by then you'll be a digital being. Will it make sense to have kids? Biologically speaking, well, maybe not. Maybe the best way is to have clones. Everything that we know is going to change in the next 25 years. And you're starting to see that change in society right now through the, the, the breaking up of the fabric of the social institutions that we already know. It's already starting to, to collapse. The idea that you deliver a baby from a belly,、uh, you know, from a womb, this is a very dangerous medical thing. In five or ten years, we'll have artificial wombs where you will have babies grown just like in the Matrix movie, where you can feed them and see how they develop. And then women can continue working. They don't have to take Maternity leave anymore. It's important to understand what the impact would be on the human race if we had fewer kids. Let's take the extreme position where we just stop having kids completely and just the same people stay alive forever because there's no death, no birth. Would there actually be a problem? Well, some people say, well, then if the genetic variation, variability in the population stays the same, so evolution stops. Then we will be more vulnerable to new diseases, new bacteria that evolve or whatever. There s two problems with that argument. First problem is that if we had some bad pandemic like that, this worst case scenario, and it killed a lot of people, 
and suddenly we have more space. So we can start having kids again, and we restore the more genetic variability. So it doesn't actually change anything at all. So the argument is completely wrong already. But also, better than that, it's actually a mistake to suppose that evolution would stop if we stopped having kids. The main reason it's a mistake is because we are now developing ways to do gene therapy. In other words, to alter the genetic composition of people who are already alive. And when we get to be able to do that well, which isn't very far away, maybe 20, 30 years away, we will actually be able to evolve much more quickly than we've ever been able to evolve before by doing this very slow thing called reproduction. The best scenario for transhumanism is that technology continues and that the developing world catches up with the developed world and there's just not a difference between people anymore. Borders open, no more even countries. Everything is just one giant, wonderful planet Earth where everybody can live as long as they want. They can choose how much transhumanist technology they want to have. They can choose whether they want to live forever. They can choose whether they want to remain religious. They can choose parts and pieces of, of the bounty that science and technology has brought us. And I think we can live very comfortably on planet Earth for thousands of more years. The dystopian version, though, the what's the worst that can happen with transhumanism? Well, there's a lot of terrible things that can happen. First off, artificial intelligence can take over something very similar to the Terminator and literally say, we don't need human beings anymore. Let's just wipe out biological organisms. Another thing that can happen is that we can create some type of terrible plague through genetic editing, which is one of the foremost transhumanist technologies, a plague that nobody can control. And the plan is then left to maybe primates again, gorillas and you know, orangutans and whatnot. Another thing that can happen is that maybe some very rich people take the transhumanist technology and they become so powerful through it and they decide they want to enslave the rest of uh, the humans. And then you have an oligarch that rules um, you know, some super godlike transhumanist beings that are half machine, half people, and then they rule, keep no, no technology allowed to the poor people, and that's a, a big break in civilization. That's another terrible scenario. So there are some very real worries out there, and I have always said that while I am a transhumanist, we must be very cautious that we don't go down the dystopian route, because this is forever. We could change the world in a negative way forever. Science and technology allows humanity to evolve. And I do not think that this should be regarded as some kind of unnatural, different sort of evolution from what we have done in the past. You know, science is really at a, a pinnacle right now, I believe. Uh, last century, you know, the 19, uh, you know, 30s to the 1950s, you know, was really the age of, of physics where we learned about the atom. And, uh, you know, one of the forefronts right now, I think that's very similar is the, is the brain. You know, we understand structure, we understand a little bit of how it functions, but we really don't understand things like consciousness, you know, a lot of how the brain really functions. Um, and this is happening really worldwide. There are initiatives not only in the U.S. in the Brain Initiative, but also in Europe and across the world. What is the difference human and animal, right? The human is a monkey to use the tools and technologies. If we don't use the technologies, we cannot be a human, right? So m most extreme technology is a robot. The definitely we're going to use a robot and technologies more and more and extend our abilities. So that is a human. That, you know, so because of, of uh, we are humans, so we, we will do that. If we improve, develop the more technologies, if we improve the more better medias, if by accepting a new technologies and new medias, uh, I think uh, we, can have, we can develop the much better societies. At least we don't kill each other. But uh, you know, people can find the, uh, some meaning to survive in the world, right? So I think uh, you know, robots and computers, these are, a media to extend the human abilities to human possibilities. The ability and the desire to invent technology is natural. It's something that is naturally built into humanity. So I think it is a mistake to suggest that when we change the world in the way that we feel we'd like to do to improve our lives, then that is somehow unnatural, somehow different from what other people do. If you lose your humanness, isn't that the end of humanity? And the answer is yes. Yes, of course it is. But that's like saying when the human being evolved from being a, a gorilla, that was the end of the gorilla. Well, we're gonna look back and say it, it was a good thing to end 
the human race, the end humanity. This is a gradual state of us becoming a much more evolved, spiritual, and magnificent being. We are evolving into gods, and we should, we should embrace every path along the road that we come across, but we shouldn't hold ourselves back. It's a road we want to travel down.